So, um, thanks for coming. I'm Jamie Pride. I'm from IBM in the UK. Uh, I've been a software developer for nearly 10 years now. I spent the first nine years of my career working on IBM's Spectrum Virtualize and Flash System block storage arrays, and I've spent the last year working on Ceph, uh, specifically as part of the UK team looking at how we can improve the performance of erasure coding for block and file workloads. Um, today, this is five ways to split a squid, and we're going to be looking at the different plugins that we support for erasure coding in Ceph. Um, so we'll very briefly have a refresher on why you might want to use erasure coding in Ceph. Um, we'll take a look at some of the plugins we support. Uh, I'll show you some of the current usage statistics from telemetry. I have some benchmarks I would like to share, and then I'll try and leave you with a couple of key takeaway points. So why use erasure coding? Uh, so when you create a new pool in Ceph, you need to decide how you're going to protect your data. Um, you can choose to use replication, where we create copies of your data um, across the pool, or you can choose to use erasure coding, where we take each object, split it up into equal sized chunks uh, that we call K, and then ask a plugin to generate additional equal sized parity chunks for redundancy that we call M. Um, so if you're using replication, you're probably using three times replication so that you can survive losing any two copies of your data. Uh, the obvious disadvantage with this is that you're using a lot of storage. And for every one terabyte of data you want to store, you need three terabytes of storage space. Uh, so that costs a lot of money. What's the alternative? It's erasure coding. Um, so when you create an erasure coded pool in Ceph, uh, you need to use an erasure code profile. That profile has information about which plugin we're going to use to encode and decode the data. That's a separate code library that Ceph loads to do the encoding. Um, and you need to specify the K and M values, so a number of data chunks and number of parity chunks. Now, depending on the ratio of K to M chunks that you choose, um, as we see in this table, the storage overhead changes. Um, so compared to three times replication, where we have a 3x overhead, um, if I have a K equals 4, M equals 2 erasure code pool, then I have a 1.5 times storage overhead. So for every one terabyte of data I have, I only need 1.5 terabytes of storage. Um, now, as you can see, as we increase K in the K to M ratio, uh, the storage overhead gets better, but there are diminishing returns there and the uh, performance impact. Um, M being equal to 2 means we can lose any two of our OSDs, or hosts, if we have one OSD per host, um, and still have access to our data. So that's similar to being able to lose two copies um, in our 3x replicated pool. It's also similar to how a traditional block or file appliance works using RAID 6 where it can lose any two drives and still have access to the data and rebuild. The nice thing about Ceph's erasure coding is that it's a bit more flexible than that, though. And so we can set M to different values, for example, 3 or 4, if we want to be able to lose 3 or 4 OSDs. Um, but again, that's going to impact your storage usage. And it's also going to come with a performance cost as we have to encode uh, more parity. Um, so the first uh, plugin we're going to look at is JErasure. Now, this is the default plugin in Ceph and the most commonly used one. So if you currently use Erasure coding, you're probably using JErasure. It works in a pretty straightforward way at a high level. And we give it the equal size data chunks. Um, it uses some maths to generate the equal size coding chunks based on what your M value is. And then each one of these chunks is stored on a different OSD. Um, one of the big Problems with JErasure is that it's actually no longer actively maintained by the original code authors. So the repository has been taken offline. It's not available anymore. The source code has been archived. You can download it in a PDF, but there are no updates being made to it. Um, so while JErasure supports Intel, AMD, and ARM CPUs, and it does have support for SSE and ARM Neon vector instructions, which it can use to encode uh, multiple bits of data and decode multiple bits of data at once. It doesn't support the more modern AVX instructions on Intel and AMD CPUs, which are wider and allow more encoding and decoding at once. And as it's no longer being maintained, it's probably not going to be updated to support those. Uh, the second plugin we support in Ceph is ISIL, or the Intel Intelligent Storage Acceleration Library. Um, so this works in a very similar way to JErasure. Um, when you create a profile using ISIL, um, uh, you select a technique, just like you do with JErasure, which is the algorithm that gets used to do the encoding and decoding. Um, and so just like JErasure, we give ISIL the data chunks. It does some maths to generate the parity or coding chunks. And each one of those is stored in a separate OSD. Um, so you might see the word Intel in there. 
And if you've Googled for information on Ceph's plugins, uh, Razor Code plugins it supports, then you might have found some older blogs, documentation, even some books about Ceph that say that ISIL only supports Intel CPUs. That's not true. Uh, today, ISIL supports Intel, AMD, and ARM CPUs, just like JRazor does. Uh, and unlike JRazor, ISIL is still actively maintained. So there's a GitHub repo uh, where uh, issues can be raised and changes are delivered. Um, so while ISIL also supports the SSE and ARM Neon vector instructions, it also has support for the wider AVX, AVX2 and AVX512 instructions as well, which means it can encode and decode more data at once. And we'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, so one of the disadvantages with Erasure coding, and specifically the ISIL and JRazor plugins, is what happens when we lose a chunk. So if an OSD goes down or a host goes down, uh, and say in this diagram we've lost the first chunk, in order to rebuild that chunk and get back up to full redundancy, we need to read data from k number of other chunks. So in this case, four, because we're using a four plus two profile. Uh, so that means lots of um, disk reads, network traffic, and then lots of CPU usage on the node that, or the host that's actually doing the rebuilding of the lost chunk. Um, so we support three other plugins in Ceph. Um, I don't have time to go through each one of these individually. Um, LRC, Sheck, and Clay, but they all share a similar goal. So that problem on the previous slide where we're trying to rebuild and get back up to full redundancy, these plugins all try and tackle that um, and improve the recovery efficiency uh, when OSDs go down in slightly different ways. So I've added some slides to an appendix at the end with more diagrams and lots of notes about how each one of these works. Uh, so you can take a look at that afterwards if you'd like to. Um, this is a snapshot from Ceph's public telemetry dashboard on the 15th of November. Um, so public telemetry is opt-in. So this is not every Ceph cluster in the world. But of the 3,385 clusters that are uploading to telemetry, um, 898 of that, those are using erasure coding, so between a quarter and a third. Um, of those, 862 are using JRazor. And of those, 855 are using the default technique, so that's the algorithm to do the encoding and decoding, uh, which is Reed Solomon Vandermond. Um, so what can we take away from that? It looks like most people, when they're using erasure coding, are just using the default settings. Um, Reed Solomon Vandermond encoding is getting very good coverage. Um, unfortunately, ISIL's Reed Solomon Vandermond technique works in a very similar way to JRazor's. Um, and the other thing you can maybe take away is you'd have to be quite brave to use LRC or Shack on a production system. Um, now, uh, this is a benchmark um, taken using Ceph's Erasure Code benchmark tool. Uh, you can find that in Ceph's source tree. So if you want to go and run this on a host, you can download it and build it yourself and run it. Now, it's important to note this isn't an, an active Ceph cluster running with disk usage and network uh, traffic. This is a, a benchmark that's taking an 80 megabyte object, splitting it up into k equal size chunks, um, giving those chunks to the plugin, and then seeing how quickly the plugin can encode or decode the data. So we're getting sort of the raw plugins encoding and decoding performance on the CPU. Um, this graph is on an Intel, uh, Intel Xeon CPU from 2021, so a reasonably modern one that supports AVX 512. The top two lines here are actually overlapping. Those are the two ISIL techniques. Um, this blue line is JRazor, Reed, Solomon, Vandermond. The green line is JRazor, Couchy. Up and down the y-axis, we have gigabytes per second. Along the bottom, we have K and M. Uh, and so what can we see here? Uh, ISIL is getting, in some cases, a four or five times performance boost um, over JRazor. Uh, that's thanks to the, the AVX instructions. Um, and we can also see that although JRazor supports some other techniques, uh, so the Couchy optimization and these shorter lines, which are RAID 6 optimizations for JRazor, not really giving a huge advantage over Reed Solomon Vandermond mode. Um, this is a decoding graph on the same CPU. So again, uh, gigabytes per second up and down the y-axis, uh, K, M, and number of erasures along the bottom. And number of erasures is basically how many chunks are we deleting and then trying to rebuild. Um, and so it's a similar takeaway here. Uh, ISIL, in some cases, getting sort of four or five times the decoding performance over JRazor. Uh, and again, 
the JRager's additional optimized techniques not really making much of an improvement. And just to show that it's not just on Intel CPUs where we see an advantage, this is an AMD Epic CPU, also from 2021. Um, but this one only supports AVX2. It doesn't support AVX512. Um, and it's the same trends, really. Um, the top two graphs are the ISIL graphs. Um, not as big a performance gain as was on, seen on the Intel CPU, but still maybe double encoding performance. And actually, the JRazor's optimized techniques are all doing slightly worse here than Reed Solomon Vandermond. And again, this is a dec decoding graph uh, on the same AMD CPU. And again, seeing the same thing where we're getting maybe about double performance using ISIL as we are um, with JRazor. So um, in summary, uh, the benchmark shows that the Reed Solomon Vandermond technique, which is the default one when you create a new Razor code pool, is very performant on modern CPUs thanks to the vector instructions, even on JRazor using SSE and particularly on ISIL using AVX. Um, the benchmark shows that ISIL has a pretty significant advantage over JRazor today thanks to still being maintained and having support for the AVX instructions. So I'd recommend trying out ISIL um, when making a new Razor coded pool. And I have a pool request open uh, that proposes changing the defaults in Ceph. So if you just use the default values and make a new pool, uh, you will use ISIL. Um, LRC, Clay, and Sheck are worth considering for niche use cases. So for example, if you are very network bandwidth limited and you want to speed up that rebuild when an OSD or host goes down, those might be worth checking out. But again, they're not used very much, so don't get a lot of coverage. Uh, and finally, uh, Connor Fawcett has another talk on Erasure Coding tomorrow where he's going to share some updates about the performance improvements we've been making. He has some really cool graphs that show sort of the gains that we've been making for block workloads um, using partial writes and partial reads. So ch I'd recommend checking that out. Um, me, Bill Scales, who's the team lead, Alex Ains, Cohen Connor will all be around if anyone's interested in Razor coding, plugins, or the performance improvements and would like to talk more. Uh, and that's it. So thank you. <laughs>